For the next portion of the program, we will focus on some of the challenges highlighted and exacerbated by the COVID experience. We have a terrific group of New Deal leaders and policy experts to talk about the opportunity that exists now to build back better, especially in light of increased funding and attention to these issues. We start with child care. Uh, welcome to Vermont, Lieutenant Governor Molly Gray, Sam Abbott, F Family Economic Security Policy Analyst at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, and our moderator, Amanda Zichelli, a Senior Technical Assistant Specialist at Zero to Three, uh, where her work is focused on advancing state policies that support the well-being of infants and toddlers. So Amanda, uh, Lieutenant Governor Gray, and Sam, welcome, and looking forward to the conversation. This is for Hi, everybody. It is such an honor to be here with you all today um, and talk about this, this important issue and challenge, which certainly has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, so I'm just going to start with a little bit of framing, and then I have some questions um, to bring in the Lieutenant Governor and, and Sam. Um, so, um, so I want to start with the sense of urgency. Why, why do we need to focus on the youngest children in our communities? And I know many of you um, have, already, have already been champions for young children in your communities. Um, we know that babies' brains develop faster between the ages of birth and, and three than at any later point in life. And this is this critical opportunity, um, the experiences that a young child has, the relationships they have with their families and their caregivers, they literally shape the architecture of the brain, um, setting up children for success in, in school and, and in, in life throughout their health and their social emotional health. Um, we, the stakes are really high and we need to get it right for these young children. At the same time, we look at the families in our communities. Um, many of whom are really struggling to find childcare. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, around 60% of mothers with children under the age of three were in the workforce. Um, and, and those families, um, the pandemic has really highlighted just how much those families need high quality and affordable childcare options. And, and families have different needs. They, they may have different needs and preferences for the, for the types of care that they need. And so our communities need to have a range of options that are affordable and high quality to meet families' needs. So what is our challenge? What is the big challenge? And I, I can see that you, you, met, you all have, have been problem solvers in your communities and, and taking on these challenges. Um, we have a child care market that just isn't working. It isn't working for parents, it isn't working for, for the providers and the workforce. And I'm gonna give you a few data points just to show um, how this system is not working. Um, first, affordability. Um, Childcare is one of the largest expenses in a family's budget, particularly for families with infants and toddlers. Um, in, in 30 states and the District of Columbia, infant toddler care costs more than um, tuition at a public university. So it's a huge burden on families, most of whom don't receive any, any type of, of public subsidy or support. At the same time, we have the system that's burdening parents. The workforce um, are earning wages that are way below what, how we should value um, the, the important work that they do with young children um, and, and simply not providing a living wage. We have an, a workforce um, earning about an average of $11 an hour working with our babies and toddlers, and that's pretty shocking. Um, and then the final point showing that our current system isn't working, um, many families simply can't find care. We have about half of families living in what we call child care deserts, where there, there's just an inaccessibility um, of care to meet their needs. And we see that now in families being unable to return to work because of limitations in child care. Um, so what we need, and um, we're all looking very um, carefully and closely at, at what's happening with Build Back Better, um, what we really need are more public resources to take that burden off of families and providers. Um, and um, Build Back Better, if, if it moves forward as, as written, um, could bring about some really transformational change that, can, that could address um, these deep-seated challenges. 
I want to make one, one more point before I um, turn to our panel. Um, I urge you all, I know many of you have been champions for expanding public pre-K in your community, which is, is really vital in supporting children's learning. Um, I urge you to, to, think, to think bigger, to start earlier, um, to think about the full continuum from birth to five. Um, we know that those infant toddler years are when we have some of the biggest challenges around cost and quality and access. Um, Pre-K is vitally important too. Um, we need both. We need, bo we need the full investment from birth to five. And, um, and I, I wanted to highlight there's a brief that Zero to Three has recently published that I think is in your materials. Um, that when we don't invest, when we don't look at that full continuum, there can be unintended consequences. So in states and communities that have invested in public pre-K, and particularly where it's concentrated in public schools, um, it can actually have a detrimental effect on access to infant toddler care by destabilizing those programs in the community that had, had previously been serving um, kids from birth to five. Um, so we have a publication that lays out strategies on how to mitigate that, that risk of, of um, actually hurting the infant toddler market um, and how to think more comprehensively about birth to five. And I'm happy to, to share more details with any of you who may be interested. Um, but I want to turn to our, our panel today. I'm, I'm thrilled to have um, Sam Abbott and Lieutenant Governor Gray here with us. Um, I'm going to start with Sam. Um, in, in addition to the reasons that I've laid out for um, investing in, in early care and education, there's, there's a, an argument to be made that, that this is a um, investment in broader economic growth, um, and Sam has done um, a lot of work on that. So can you, can you talk more about why that is the case and why um, this moment now as we're recovering from the pandemic, this is a particularly critical investment? Sure, thank you. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, at Equitable Growth, we put out a report uh, back in September on really the role that childcare plays in our economy. We uh, talked to a lot of childcare experts, a lot of advocates. We read dozens, if not hundreds, of peer-reviewed uh, work by economists and social scientists because we really wanted whatever claims we made to be grounded in the evidence. And what we produced was a report that probably doesn't say anything that any parent in this room and across the country doesn't already know, which is that childcare is too expensive, it's too hard to find, and you can't even think about going to work or going to school or attending a job training if you don't know that your child is cared for in a safe uh, and nurturing environment. So we start with the premise that the system we have right now is already too expensive. It's already costing parents and families a lot of money, just directly out of their pocket, and it's creating a drag on our entire economy that's costing all of us money. So then we turned the page and said, well, what if we had the policies that help make childcare more accessible and affordable for all families? Where might we expect there to be opportunities for economic growth? And the answer is in many ways kind of obvious, but it's helpful that there is the evidence and the research that backs this up. In the immediate term, it comes from parental employment. Right, uh, economists and, and researchers have long established that when the price of childcare goes down, parental employment goes up, particularly maternal employment. Uh, when the supply of childcare in a community in a geographic area increases, so too does the, the parental labor supply. Uh, so, you know, right away, if you can make that change, if you can remove the barrier to work that 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 hot that expensive, hard to find childcare is. You have more people in the labor force. You have a larger, more diverse pool of, of applicants for employers to choose from. Yeah, higher household income, greater consumer spending, a larger tax, ba tax base to help fund pro-growth uh, pro government programs. And you have your, your sort of catalyst for immediate economic growth that way. Where we really see the returns, however, is in the long term. And there we started looking at some of the research on early education and sort of high quality uh, uh, early care programs like your Head Starts or your universal pre-K programs in places like Tulsa, Oklahoma and West Virginia and uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And there where we have, you know, 20 or so years of data to look at, the results are, are fairly remarkable in terms of, of participants in these programs growing up to report better educational outcomes, better uh, employment outcomes, higher household incomes, reduced contact with the criminal and juvenile justice system. Uh, because early childhood is such a, a, a critically important developmental period, as Amanda was just describing. So the investments we make today in child care and early education start paying off immediately with parental employment, but we really see some of our greatest returns in the long term when we start looking at the next generation of workers and, and, and uh, breadwinners and parents uh, that the children of today grow up into. 
that's the general story. That was true in 2021. It was true in 2019. We've also had this pandemic in the middle that has really complicated a lot of things. And the role childcare has played in the pandemic has been you know, widely discussed. There's a lot of, of rigorous debate and conversation about you know, what role childcare really has in, in uh, the pandemic recovery. How many young parents with children, or parents with young children, are there really out there that aren't working now because of pandemic-related closures? And those are all important questions, but I think they somewhat miss the point. Uh, the childcare system we have now has been a barrier to work for decades. It has been uh, preventing and, and, and uh, tamping down parental labor force participation for years prior to the pandemic. So you can't return people to jobs they never had. But if we're looking at, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you all have been talking and will continue to talk about workforce shortages and, and what's going on in the labor force right now. Uh, we know that a lot of people left it during the pandemic. A lot of people retired. They may never be coming back. And uh, it's not enough just to return everybody to their pre-pandemic, their pre-pandemic jobs. Uh, you, you might need to bring some new people into the labor force, some people that weren't expecting to be in the labor force because they had these childcare concerns that they assumed might prevent them from uh, going to work or returning to work. Uh, and we, we shouldn't also skip past the sort of very real experience of parents that are still dealing with pandemic-related childcare closures, even if that's not the, you know, the majority of people that have yet to return to the labor force, and, and even if these people still have jobs, but they're just, they're just pulling double duty right now, taking care of kids and working at the same time, you know, potentially approaching burnout and on the cusp of joining that great resignation that's going on right now. Uh, the latest research I saw was that uh, as of September, about one in four childcare centers are still either closed or significantly, have significantly reduced their capacity, uh, below 50% from their pre-pandemic uh, enrollment status. Uh, it, that is, uh, unfortunately, uh, families of color, particularly black and Hispanic families, are more likely to be dealing with these closures and this reduced capacity issue than white families. So if we want an equitable recovery for the total economy, where everybody can share in, in broad-based and sustainable growth, you need uh, an equitable recovery of the childcare market, uh, and that's where really the careful uh, distribution of these American Rescue Plan dollars becomes, becomes so key. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Sam. Um, I want to turn to Lieutenant Governor Gray. Um, I understand that you recently had an opportunity to tour your state and talk to constituents about their, their needs as you recover from the pandemic. Um, what are you hearing from parents and from child care providers? Well, thank you for the question, Sam. I'm regretting not having my notebook because I would just be writing down one thing after another that you just said, and I'll do that after. Um, I just want to start by thanking everyone for being here. It's wonderful to be on this panel. Also recognizing that we're in what feels like a barn. I grew up on a farm in rural Orange County, so this feels really good. Um, I spent the last five months spending a, a day per week in a different county in Vermont. We're 14 counties, pretty small. Uh, in the Northeast Kingdom, the most rural part of the state, sort of where New Hampshire, Canada, and Vermont come together, 15% of Vermonters live in poverty. I don't know if there's the folks from Maine who are here. If you raise your hand, do we have any Mainers? No Mainers. Vermont is the second or first oldest state in the nation. We um, compete with Maine regularly. We lost 28,000 people in the workforce during the pandemic. Uh, the highest number of employment claims are the greatest percentage of employment claims in the nation filed by women were filed in Vermont in the months of October and November of last year, about 74% of unemployment claims. So Vermont, or Vermont women really contribute to the, I believe it's 80 million women who left the workforce nationally. So what I heard from Vermonters and what I continue to hear every day, and I want to recognize, we keep saying we're out of the pandemic, but we're really not. We're not even in an endemic yet. Um, but what I heard from Vermonters, what I saw, meeting with our family and child care centers, meeting with our designated mental health agencies, which are often working um, to provide parents with access to different child care facilities. We've seen a proliferation of facilities closing, right? So obviously that impacts parents. Um, some parents driving 45 minutes in rural Vermont trying to get their child to a place where they can access child care and then driving to work, and then 45 minutes again at night. So if you, if you do the, the time on the clock, that's quite a bit of time. Um, but then sitting with child care providers in tears, right? And I'm sure you've also experienced this if you've been meeting with providers, like asking 
for a lifeline. And the, the palpable crisis, I think, comes from um, child care providers are also parents and going home and not only caring for our kids. I have a, a, I'm a stepmom now to 11 and uh, soon to be 13 year old, um, caring for kids during the day, but then coming home and also trying to care for kids. And when kids get sick, um, providers having to leave the workforce, not having enough subs. I talked to one director who was stepping in to meet the needs on a daily basis. Um, in Vermont in particular, Vermonters spend on average $20,000 a year on childcare, which for a small aging state with a, a shrinking workforce and a generation that's really struggling to care for kids and to care for parents, um, that's a lot. On average, a two-parent household with two kids is spending 40% of their income on childcare, um, more than uh, Vermont State College education, which is also some of the most expensive state college education in the state. So just to give you a sense, but I, I know that Vermont's not alone. <laughs> we, we think we're special, but I know that rural states um, and rural communities across this country are really struggling to figure out what this means economically. The economic par parallels are obviously um, there, and it's trying to, um, and I can talk about some of those solutions through the, through the, uh, Recover Stronger tour that I did, that's what we called it. Um, I just released a report on Monday with 10 different things that we can do right now to invest the American Rescue Plan Act funds um, to one, meet the immediate crisis, two, help families, and three, make sure that we're investing in a strong um, early childhood educator workforce. But happy to talk more about that. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna move to talking about solutions. Um, and so, so I'm wondering if you could speak a little more about um, how Vermont is using those American Rescue Plan funds um, to support childcare, and then recognizing that's a, that's a short-term infusion of money, um, what's your longer-term vision for early care and education in Vermont? So we haven't invested the funds yet, and I think it was a really interesting conversation yesterday at the White House. Uh, some Vermonters, I think a lot of Americans, aren't gonna feel those funds until our legislators begin implementing, and so as mayors, you're also going through the process of figuring out the local pots of money and how those match with the state pots of money. So going into the legislative session this year, coming forward with an agenda, one, around the lifeline. How do we bring up those wages so we don't have childcare providers going to Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's or Burger King because they're making more money and they're getting more benefits? So having a livable wage um, within the workforce right now. Also considering bonuses to keep childcare workers um, being able to succeed. Um, I think mental health and support services are important, making ch sure childcare providers have access to childcare. Um, we have the childcare financial assistance plan, um, which basically means if you meet a certain income qualification that you have access to childcare at a reduced rate or for free. But very quickly for a lot of Vermonters, you reach the benefits clip. So do you take that raise? Um, do you take a job that pays you a little bit more and then lose access to affordable childcare? So expanding access to that program immediately, doing everything we can to uh, support recruitment and to really help uh, the next generation that is looking at um, going into early childhood education, which is what it is, making sure we have tuition repayment or loan forgiveness, um, trying to find opportunities right now to meet recruitment, to re to meet retention, and then to keep our centers open. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking, and I know I know the Build Back Better acts on everyone's mind, um, and it's um, you know we don't we don't know yet. Um, what will happen, um, but I'm wondering how, both, question for both of you, um, how you how you think this bill could transform early care and education in this country, um, and what, for those in the room who, who may be tasked with implementation, um, what are some of the, the challenges and opportunities that they'll face? Do you want to take that? Go sure. for it. Sure. Um, you know, I, I think what's most, uh, could be most impactful about Build Back Better, besides um, the ways it's going to make childcare more affordable for families, is the infusion of those public dollars that are really the only way to correct what's going on in the childcare market, which is, is an unusual market, right? We're asking parents early in their life, probably early in their careers, to spend $10,000, $20,000 they probably don't have. 
uh, providers are, are cutting costs really down to the bone, but there's only, only so low, you, only so many cuts you can make and still have safe, uh, a safe, habitable you know, child care facility. Uh, so we've got this strange situation where parents are, are paying too much, but they're also kind of getting a discount on the backs of the workers who are making very low wages and the providers who are getting by on, on razor, razor thin profit margins. The way the sort of economics of that works out is that childcare providers need to keep enrollment basically at the near top at all times, right? You need to have full enrollment in order to stay in the black. And when there's an economic downturn, you know, it doesn't need to be as dramatic as the pandemic recession, but you know, in, in this case, unfortunately, it was. Just a f removing a few children from that classroom can really uh, cause a ripple effect that skews the economics of that childcare provider and really easily send them into the red. Um, so we have research that shows, uh, you know, when, when the economy is shedding jobs, the childcare industry is shedding jobs a lot faster. And when the child, when the economy is gaining jobs again, uh, the childcare industry is gaining jobs a lot slower. There's kind of a chicken and an egg problem where like we need those childcare jobs for people to go back to work, but we need people buying childcare so the provider has enough money to hire new people. And uh, the reality is, uh, the, a system built on parent fees, a system where the, the parents are responsible for 100% of childcare costs is never going to be stable and it's never going to fund childcare uh, at the rate which it, 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 it needs to be. So this infusion of public dollars is pretty exciting um, if it does pass. We saw during the pandemic that, that, that uh, your pre-K providers, your Head Start providers, your, your childcare providers that have access to subsidies we're able to weather the storm a lot better than those that were just relying on parent fees. That stability in public dollars was so important for making sure that that childcare market was there so that that childcare market could support the broader economy getting back to work. I have a little bit to add, but that's good. Please that's do. a lot. <laughs> it's an, such an important investment. I think the, we say if, the Build Back Better plan has to pass. It has I to pass. So. Beca and here's why it has to pass. Um, because broadband, fiber to the home, hopefully we'll see it in three years or four years, I don't know how long it takes for broadband to be deployed in your communities, but it takes a while in Vermont. Um, roads and bridges, we'll see them, but we may not see them in our terms and in our um, the next five years, I don't know, but we're investing in them, right? And that's extremely, extremely important. EV, wastewater, sewage, et cetera, yes, we need all of that. But what families need right now across the state, across the nation, our immediate support services. The investment in people, childcare, paid family and medical leave, which a lot of childcare providers said, if I have to take care of my child or my parent when um, they are sick and they are leaving school because they have symptoms that are like COVID but may not be COVID, right? Um, I can't just leave my job and we can't have a system where we are paying unemployment instead of paying paid family and medical leave. So the, child, the Build Back Better agenda has to pass. It really, really does. And it's important because that means all of us in our communities across this country and our states can have something to immediately provide to people who are in crisis. Um, very, very concretely, there's a big difference between paying 40% of your income as a middle-income family on childcare and 7% of your income as a middle-income family on childcare, and that's what the Build Back Better plan includes um, very, very specifically. But for a workforce that needs to be reinvigorated, that really needs to, um, you know, to have parents that are able to stay in the workforce to afford childcare, but then also to have childcare workers, um, early childhood educators feel fully supported. This is it, and this is the moment, um, and really not backing down from that and making sure that it is about the ec economics Absolutely, but it's also about um, morality and where we're at and just caring for people and caring for our communities generally. Thank you, and I, I would just stress, and I know you all have different roles in your, your states and communities. If this, if this does pass, it, it, it will be once in, a, once in a generation, maybe once in, in a couple of generations opportunity to rebuild this, this broken system. Um, 
And it's, it's going to be a, an implementation challenge. It's going to be a lot to do fairly quickly. Um, and I urge all of you in, in, your, in your roles as communicators and implementers, um, it's really important that we get this right and that we, we listen to families and providers um, throughout the implementation um, and, and really demonstrate um, that this kind of investment in the system can make a difference. Uh, we now turn to the issue of access to high-speed internet, which we know has been on the minds of a lot of New Deal leaders. Uh, for the past few months, uh, the New Deal Forum has convened a broadband task force to identify the major obstacles limiting access to high-speed internet, develop state and local solutions, and advocate for a strong federal, state, local partnership. Uh, so just thank you first to everyone who's participated in those meetings. We've had great um, participation from both New Deal leaders as well as from the private sector, which has been fantastic. Um, our next panel will continue on these same themes that the task force has been addressing and hope you will also stay tuned for a report that we'll be releasing uh, in the next couple of months, uh, which we will encapsulate all we've learned from New Deal leaders and from partners about best practices to address the issue of using funds from the American Rescue Plan, the infrastructure bill, infrastructure bill and other sources uh, to address this issue. Uh, so now I want to welcome our next panelist, uh, Senator Loran Osley from Florida, a co-chair of our Broadband Task Force, uh, Colorado Senator Kerry Donovan, and Donna Ratley Washington from Education Superhighway. Uh, Donna is Vice President for Government Affairs uh, at Education Superhighway, which is a national nonprofit with the mission to close the digital divide for the 18 million households that have access to the internet but cannot afford to connect. So, Donna, Senator Osley, and Senator Donovan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. The, okay. Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for that wonderful welcome, and thank you, Senators, for being here. I know everyone's looking forward to your on-the-ground stories um, of tackling this uh, issue. So I'll just kind of set the, the plate and the stage a little bit. March 2020, right? Um, doors closed for, you know, 55 million uh, K-12 students around the country. Uh, we started washing, you know, our grocery bags as they came to the front door. We realized we didn't have to do that, but we did it for a long time. And... Um, you know, we realized uh, the extent of how many students were, were not connected. Uh, the numbers were about 15 to 17 million K-12 students um, could not uh, remote learn. And so what we had known about since 2009, the homework gap, um, became the learning gap. Students simply couldn't uh, go to school. And so, you know, most of us saw that really sad picture of the kids sitting out of the Taco Bell uh, in Los Angeles, you know, trying desperately to con connect to remote uh, Wi-Fi. So Education Superhighway data uh, is our driving force. And we, uh, our data tells us there are about 28 million households who are offline uh, in this country. 18 million because they just simply can't afford it. Seven million because there's a lack of infrastructure, and three million, you know, really have no good reason. Uh, they don't lack infrastructure, and uh, their incomes tell us they they can afford it. So, you know, what happens? Congress appropriates, you know, historic amounts of funding. So the American Rescue Act, ten billion, is come out right in September that Treasury is going to manage. And states right off the bat from that are going to get 100 million. Every state's going to get 100 million. And then they'll get a proportionate share based on their population and based on how many rural and low income uh, individuals live in their state. Florida, 366 million allocation. Colorado, 170. Anybody from California, you know, unexpected, not unexpected. David Silver there from Oakland. Uh, Chalks in at the highest number at uh, $544 million. And then there's the Build Back Better, $65 billion uh, for states, uh, for broadband. And states, again, are going to get off the bat $100 million, right off the bat. And then a share based on how many unserved households 
based on FCC uh, data maps and how many unserved households are in high cost areas. So that's a lot of money. Um, there's then, so there's 42 billion, right, to build out for, for infrastructure. And that's the 100 million that you'll get right off the bat. There's an additional 14 billion um, that's gonna extend the federal subsidies that each household uh, who's eligible, income eligible will receive. And so, um, you know, unfortunately right now, and I'm encouraging you all to, to think about this, um, only 16% of eligible households have taken advantage of those federal subsidies. Uh, that's the national number, it holds pretty true for states uh, and cities around the country. Um, of course, some are doing better than others in getting their fair share. There's another 2.74 billion for digital equity and inclusion uh, efforts. 60 million that you can use for planning and then the rest for uh, actual capacity grants and then a, a competitive process. Okay, so that's a lot. It's, it's a historic investment in broadband. What, what, are, you, what are you gonna do uh, with all that money? So I encourage you, we encourage you to uh, read our newly released report, The Affordability Gap. It's chock full of data and policy recommendations. And I'll highlight three critical um, interventions uh, that we recommend. One, get the data. Know who is connected and who is not connected. Uh, we've entered into non-disclosure agreements with 130 ISPs around the country covering 90% of K-12. We can tell communities who is not connected and what ISP can connect them. Surveys are great. People don't answer them. They think mobile is the same as having at-home broadband. So uh, start with the data. And then once you have dat data, targeted data, stand up a broadband adoption effort, right? Again, 16% of eligible households are, are accessing that money. States are leaving that money, their fair share for, for their communities on the table. So after you stand up that, look at best practices, innovate, leverage technology, leverage innovation. So our intervention is putting uh, public Wi-Fi access points in low-income apartment buildings and in public housing. It solves for affordability, it is free, and it solves for the enrollment challenges that we all know exist. Again, the 16% accessing federal subsidies. I have to call out David Silver, uh, who's in the audience uh, for, from Oakland. He's the Director of Education for the City of Oakland. We just entered into um, a four-year agreement with the City of Oakland to conquer their divide over the next four years using those three critical uh, interventions. And David and, and his work, and hopefully we might have a chance to hear from him later, he really exemplifies what communities need to do. One, corral all the right stakeholders, get them in the room, right? Leverage innovation, look out what's the best practices, leverage innovation. Two, whatever your process is, root it and guide it by the data. So that's my recommendation. Love to get into that more and hopefully David uh, can expand a little bit, but would love to talk to uh, the senators here who both um, have established themselves as, as broadband experts uh, within their state and, and within uh, the country. So Senator Osley from Florida uh, actually says Senator Donovan is her inspiration, which is amazing given her uh, national and state profile on this issue. She's also, I have to mention, a triath uh, Ironman triathlete. What? So we know, right, right? We know she's <laughs> tough and we know she can withstand large amounts of pain. <laughs> and so we think that that means she can tell us how a New Deal Democrat is effective in a red state. And she'll tell us more about that. Uh, Senator Donovan um, has been a force, again, uh, in her state uh, for broadband and nationally. Prior to being a, a state senator, she was on the Vail City Council. And under, I understand recently uh, the first bill she sponsored on, uh, in, as a state senator was on broadband and just got passed. And so would love to hear lessons learned uh, from Senator Donovan. So we'll start with you, Senator Dosley. Thank you so much. And I really, I have to say, you know, we've been 
at this it's well before the pandemic. I mean, so I was served in the House in a, representing an urban district and really didn't think about broadband too much until I started um, looking at a Senate district, which included 11 counties um, that it spans it, it's nine very rural counties. And as I got out there on the campaign trail, realized be, these people do not have access. It's not that they don't can't afford internet. It is that it is not is simply not available. And this was before the pandemic, um, and so I made it sort of a cornerstone of my first year in the Senate to start thinking about this. And where do I go for ideas? But to this network, uh, the New Deal. And uh, after many conversations, where Senator Donovan. Has, she, I mean, we'll hear from her. She's been dealing with this in Colorado for for years. Um, but this is, you know, it, it's a it's a two pronged problem. Um, it is, and the and the solutions to the problems are very different. Um, rural deployment is it, it, there's a it's a smaller part of the percentages that you showed us that you gave us, but it is a harder problem to solve, um, and it's. Almost exactly like the childcare um, example that we just had, it's a business model that doesn't work. Industry is not going to go into these communities where there's not enough people um, to pay the bills. So that is, to me, where government needs to step in. And um, and the other piece is the urban adoption, and that you know there are solutions and uh, but equally challenging. But the solutions to both are very very different. And I would say the rural solution is just messy. I mean, it's just hard to get people in a room, and but now we have the money, and it's up to us to, I, I think, exactly what you said, to, um, you know, share the best practices, bring the stakeholders together, because I know in my, in my state, I tried to get things done without bringing the industry to the table. Can't, it can't be done. They have to be partners at the table with you. You may not get everything you need, but you have to start there. And I think, you know, the question that, that Tashara brought up yesterday is, a, is a vital. The technical assistance for these smaller counties and cities that the resources are there, but they don't have any way to access the resources without someone literally holding their hand. And so that, I think, from the state level, I'm pushing for our state office of broadband to provide that technical assistance, and I I'm, I'm as encouraged to hear the White House folks yesterday say that they're looking to find the best you know examples of be, of the federal government also being able to provide that assistance. Thank you, Senator. Donovan. Now for the ex yes. the real <laughs> expert. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I just want to start by saying thank you to the, the New Deal and also the supporters of the New Deal for allowing the broadband conversation to continue. Um, I, I think it's one that's easy to kind of say, um, well, it's solved or we've did it, check the box. Um, but it is groups like the New Deal that allow us to keep learning from each other and, and, and not, saying, not saying that we're done yet. Uh, it's... I. I would say we, we have an incredible opportunity in front of all of us, no matter what hat we wear in our, in our public service with this incredible influx of dollars coming in. And I would say, I think um, it would be, the easier route would be to write that policy or go through the rulemaking or have a hearing that just kind of says, this is how we're gonna spend the dollars. But I would encourage all of you to use these big dollars as a hook to really do transformative change, right? Because because you can write a policy that just says, here's how we're gonna spend the dollars. You can also use that exact same opportunity to kind of address structural flaws um, that you'll never be able to pass again if you don't have the dollar figure tied to that policy, right? Particularly with telecom. Telecom is one of the most challenging, um, well-resourced uh, uh, lobbying groups to kind of take on. And so I think what's, what's remarkable with these dollars is not only be able to solve a problem for our communities, but also maybe to enact um, legislation um, or concepts that maybe you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't have um, the carrot of dollars um, tied to it. So some lessons learned from um, Colorado um, that we've certainly, I think, would do it differently in hindsight of looking back over the past um, eight years of, of this issue um, are many. <laughs> uh, but um, some basic things that we saw, if you silo money in different departments, you really end up um, 
not using those dollars as effectively, and everyone wants to work on broadband, so your education department, your rural development, whatever they're called, your office of um, information technology, your eco devo, uh, you know, everyone wants a little chunk of broadband, um, but as you, the more and more you spread it out in departments, you just don't see that synergy. How do you address that? Um, either give it to one department and, and let them, you know, um, be that uh, be that distributor of the dollars, or have a have a group that's having that horizontal integration, you know, through your through whatever level of government you're at. Um, I've I've seen that one that's in a department versus one that's in an executive branch is a more effective horizontal entity because the executive branch, I think, is one of the best. Um, is one way you really start to see it closed off and then not open to a more broader community discussion, right? Just that's, I think, just a general habit of an executive. Um, uh, but I just lost that battle in Colorado. We just moved it out of our Department of Regulatory Agencies and moved it into the executive office right at the time when we're gonna have the most dollars we've ever had to spend. So I think it's always important to think where you put that original first nugget and you can move it, but where you put that first nugget of broadband deployment. An interesting one that I'm sure there's different opinions even in this room, but one that I've fought for is how you define high-speed broadband, right? We all know the importance of definitions in this room. But be cognizant of where you put that first marker on the ground uh, because you can result in and overbuild and upgrade instead of new deployment, right? If you put the speed high, which is, I think, intuitive where we all fall, right? We want to build the fastest internet that we can build. If you put it at a high speed and then start deploying resources with that goal, what you can see is telecom um, companies come in and they just do upgrades. Instead of if you can keep a lower speed requirement for some of your effort, that'll require them to build the new infrastructure and build out. So again, that messy lines with when we're talking about um, um, rural broadband is if we gave people higher speed funding opportunities, we weren't seeing them invest in new broadband. There's incredible opportunities with existing infrastructure for redundancy. So look wherever you guys have grid management projects. Anything where you've talked about energy or grid management, there's probably fiber there that can be utilized. Um, in Colorado and on the federal level, it can get messy because they say that you can't transmit data on those lines. But um, you can do some work on the back end to see if those, those, um, those um, your Department of Transportation probably has fiber that's not being used, for example, any of those entities. So uh, a lot of, um, a, another lesson learned, I think, is, uh, the whole picture, if you really want to deploy it, and, and this is largely on rural focus, but you have to do work on right away, right? Because like if you don't have, if you haven't done your work on, on right away access, then it doesn't matter how much money you get because you're not going to be able to build that middle mile. And then uh, I think what's critical in these conversations too is, and I'm so glad it's gaining traction, is this concept of equity in access. And so Colorado's, uh, Colorado spent a lot of time of trying to, uh, you know, this uh, a boisterous goal of 100% a, a of the state being wired. And we're at about 93% coverage right now. Um, and, and, to, and to close that final gap, this con the conversation on equity has really elevated to all of the bills that I ran last session. Uh, talked about infrastructure hurdles as well as economic hurdles. And we're, we're trying not to distinguish between those anymore. So, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude here. The last bill I ran was a $600 reimbursement program. And that could be for if you faced an infrastructure hurdle in rural Colorado, you could apply for satellite service. And if you, uh, or, equally no distinction between the program, the department, or, or how the money was talked about, or if it was an economic hurdle, your household could apply for that to cover the cost of broadband no matter where you were in the state. So I, I think in the earlier stages, 
you may have to separate out the, the infrastructure hurdle versus the economic hurdle. But in Colorado, we've luckily seen that we've now been able to uh, unify that message um, now that we had a lot of the, the pieces in place. Um, but the, the dollars, these, these significant dollars that you rattle off are, are mind-blowingly huge. Um, and an incredible, a really incredible opportunity, um, I think, in, in one of those in one of those aspects where we we do we serve our people in order to leave a legacy behind that will far outlast us in our communities, and I think that broadband is really one of those those opportunities where maybe talking about right away is not the sexiest thing you're going to do in your town hall or your newsletter. But you're going to be able to look back on it um, in years to come and see that um, where you were able to pull your your neighborhood, your state, or community. So a heck of heck of an opportunity uh, ahead of us. That's really exciting. Okay. Well, I learned a lot. Um, that that was that was fascinating, and I want to just point out one thing that was really interesting to me: how you have started to um, address the unserved as both an infrastructure and affordability. And so one piece of the, the um, you know, the 65 billion in broadband that's coming out um, gives the NTIA the opportunity to define unserved as physical infrastructure, ability to get certain speeds. And there's a little language built in there says, or other criteria which can bring in affordability. So that's something that we're pushing, push to, uh, to ensure that the definition of unserved can, all, can be either from an infrastructure or from a cost and affordability perspective. So, Leslie, you seem like you wanted to yeah, jump yeah, in. Well, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, it also includes, the, the, you know, I guess extending for, for permanency the, um, the EBB into the, in that, into the affordable connectivity plan, which I think is another important piece of that that too many Americans haven't taken advantage of yet. That's, yeah, that was the 16% number that I mentioned, and that was with EBB, Emergency Broadband Benefit, which now in Build Back Better is going to be it's affordable connectivity program, right. and that's 14 billion. Um, and again, like I said, states and to, you know folks aren't. I, the last report that came out said only 25 percent of eligible households were aware. And y'all might not even it. know this. It's 50 dollars a month for eligible households, and up to 100 dollars one time for a device. And yeah. so, if you don't know that, that's something that's really important to get out to your constituents. That's going down under ACP, so under the, it went down to $30. It hadn't gone yet. That'll be in December. But in order to extend that $14 billion for five years is, is the goal, and, and that's how the math worked out. They took that 50 to 30. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, that'll be all used up because folks will actually use it, but that should last for five years. We wrap up this part of the program with a conversation about economic revitalization, talking about initiatives that were working pre-COVID and how to think about rebuilding a post-COVID economy that is more equitable and prosperous than before the pandemic. Um, so welcome to Columbia, South Carolina Mayor Steve Benjamin, an honorary co-chair of New Deal. Uh, we have Scranton Mayor Paige Cognetti and Scott Shoecraft, Vice President for Policy at the Economic Innovation Group. Uh, I'll let Scott take it away. Is it on or do I? Okay. There. Hi, my name is Scott Shoecraft. I'm with the Economic Innovation Group. Um, many of you probably know about our group. Uh, I'll just do a quick introduction. We 
focus on economic dynamism with all of our policy, and we try to use uh, market forces to, to address some things that are traditionally uh, communities that are left behind and people who are left behind. Um, I should plug our research team and the, the, what they, their products uh, and the way that they can inform the things that you all are working on. Uh, the Distressed Community Index is probably the one that the most, peop most people are familiar with. And um, in August, we also released uh, a, a, an interactive map on income from assets on the county level across the entire country. So you can look at uh, sort of where the, the capital gains income is and the, the discrepancies and disparities uh, in communities across the country. It's, it's pretty fascinating, and the map is very informative and enlightening. Um, as far as advocacy is concerned, which is the team I head up at EIG, we have four federal priorities. Uh, first, opportunity zones, which I think everybody's probably familiar with. And um, we're working on some of the reporting requirements that got dropped out in the, uh, the BIRD process in the uh, TCGA when it was en enacted. Um, we are working to ban non-compete provisions across the country, uh, or at least render them unenforceable, with the exception of a few uh, extraordinary circumstances, dissolution of a partnership, sale of business. Um, and then we are working on a, a Heartland Visas program, which would create a high-skilled immigration program that local governments could use uh, as a, an economic development tool to grow their um, to grow their tax base by attracting these, uh, these immigrants to their communities. It's an opt-in at the county level, and eligibility is determined by some uh, characteristics of distress. Um, I think, uh, you know, coupled with, we just released earlier this week, a, a report on Tulsa Remote, which is a fascinating uh, program in Tulsa where every dollar they invested produced $13 in uh, new income within the community. And you know, if we have one lesson from that experience and from the pandemic, it's uh, people can do really well, pay, good paying jobs anywhere in the country. Uh, so you know, we, we think that that's a, that bolsters our argument for the Heartland Visa Program as an economic development tool. And lastly, the one that we launched most recently in March, shortly before I joined the organization and we've been ramping up, spending most of my time on, is uh, our inclusive wealth building initiative, which would establish a retirement account for all Americans who don't have access to an employer-sponsored plan modeled off of the thrift savings plan that the federal government has. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we talked very early on with Debbie about this because uh, a lot of the populations that you all serve are the ones that are, uh, you're the closest to the people who are going to benefit from this program in a lot of cases. Um, and there's a lot of lessons to be drawn from some of the state initiatives that have uh, been in the retirement space. So I look forward to talking to everybody about all of those uh, going forward, you can get me at scott at eig.org and I'll connect you with the research team if you have any questions about any of those things. Uh, we have a wealth of data and very good analysts, so we can help support anything you're working on uh, with that lens. Um, so I think I'll turn it over to Mayor Cognetti. Sure. Um, first of all, I have to say I'm sitting here with Mayor Benjamin. I'm feeling very... Uh, very junior. You are such a mentor to all of us mayors, and it's an honor to get to sit on a panel with you. That means I'm old, y'all, but it's no. okay. It's okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. No, I'm, I'm thrilled, and Scott, thank you. Um, it's so nice to see all of you all. Um, so Scranton, Pennsylvania. You all know it for one reason or another. Um, during, the, uh, during January, right about a week before inauguration, NBC Peacock came from New York. We're about 100 miles from New York. They drove through driving snow. I mean, the snow was, I mean, it wasn't like sticking too badly, but I mean, if you look at pictures from that, there's snow everywhere. We're covered in snow. They came to deliver a life-size Dundee Award, which we proudly display at Scranton City Hall. And it says, best hometown of the office. So a great time, you know, it was pandemic. We were all outside freezing, snow, masks, the whole deal. I think they were doing it because they wanted to make sure we remembered that we're the hometown of the office. Side note, President Joe Biden. <laughs> So we are, are well known. 
um, in, in different ways. Uh, we, at least I think we are. We try to be, we try to punch above our weight in a lot of reasons, a lot of ways. But we are um, a city of 80,000 people that has um, you know, some, some real issues. We have a, a medium income, median income that is uh, $10,000 below the living wage in the city. We have rents that are almost as high as, as Philadelphia, and, and Councilmember Green is here and can attest to the, the rents in Philadelphia are not low. So we have a lot of issues in Scranton that we are trying to address. I came into office two years ago and thought, you know, here we go, let's, let's see how we can work together. Let's look at these partnerships, there's these resources that we have throughout the country, people that want us to be successful. And then COVID comes, and we're all in this room, have been dealing with this, and we're so grateful um, for the rescue plan funding that's coming in, for the infrastructure money that's coming in, and now our challenge, of course, is to, to meet, meet the moment um, with the, the resources that we have. Um, a, a story that's kind of a microcosm of what we face, I'd say, is uh, on Juneteenth, I was excited to deliver a proclamation and speak um, alongside Senator Casey and, and our congressional representative, Matt Cartwright, at um, the, this wonderful opening of this new community center. And we had this great opening. We, are not, we can't be in the building because there's no occupancy permit. At the time, I'm not quite sure. I hadn't talked to my code enforcement team yet, but we're outside, it's June, everybody's happy. We're gonna kick off this community center. The community center had been donated to this group um, by a, a, a wonderful business. Um, but what we learned over the summer after we had that big party is that it, the building needs hundreds of thousands of dollars of work for us to even give them an occupancy permit. So we're, we're working through that. We're trying to figure out how we help them raise the funds, how we work with them to, to get some of the work done, um, maybe at a, a discounted rate, or a, maybe some people will do some of the work for free. But I always think about it because it's right now we've got, we have, there's the vision, right? So we have the vision in Scranton that this community group has this amazing vision for this community center that really can be, I mean, it's huge for our kids. We need it, not just in, in North Scranton, but all over Scranton. We need the vision of this group and these great leaders. Um, you have the, the philanthropy and the, that spirit of giving from that, from that business. They want to help them, but there's a gap, right? There's a gap from getting from vision and philanthropy and dollars available to actually being able to open that center and able to have kids there after school doing their, doing their tutoring, having their cooking classes, um, using it as a, an incubator for, for young people to be able to start businesses. So I see that as a, a microcosm of the challenges that we face in Scranton and I imagine in so many of your cities where now with the, the great work of, of so many people in this room and so many mayors and, and governors and state senators and state reps across the, the country, um, we have rescue plan funding, we've got this infrastructure funding, and now we have some, some real challenges to get those dollars to work in the ways that really will bring our communities together. Um, so that's a little bit from Scranton. Thank you. Not the home of the office, not the home of Joe Biden, uh, just a little Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, the, um, and not, and the mayor of Scranton's a lot cooler than the mayor of Columbia, I might add, too. It's, it's great to be here with you, Paige. You handle yourself very well on the national stage, incredibly well there. The, um, and it's great um, uh, to be with a lot of new friends and, and some of my old uh, friends, all my, my mayors. How many mayors are going to have? I, I count six, seven. Let's see, Mayor McLean, Lyrian. Uh, Christine is here. She's still a mayor. She got demoted to the legislature. Uh, my, man, my man, my man, Moreau and, and, and John and Adrian. Adrian calls me an OG. Uh, that's a whole nother story. And Mayor uh, uh, Beatty. Um, to see my friends in, 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 uh, in 3D is pretty cool. Um, the last couple of years have been so amazing for, for all of us. I mean, we're talking about the greatest pandemic since 1918, probably the greatest economic disruption in an election year since 1932. Uh, just left the, my, my hotel. The greatest um, uh, uh, social challenges around, around race and police violence probably since 1968, um, all, all wrapped up into one year uh, un, under President Trump uh, and, and, the, and the time in which we all needed to come together. It was a very difficult uh, period, and certainly, obviously, I'm a, I'm a mayor um, to my core, but all of us are uh, leading our communities at, at, at different times and different places with amazing uh, needs. Um, I, I think 
um, each and every one of you deserves a, a serious round of applause for the leadership that, that, that you've shown. To hear, um, uh, the, and, I, and I've thoroughly, Scott, enjoyed working with EIG over time. I mean, uh, uh, whether it was on Opportunity Zones uh, and, or, or even before that, the Investing Opportunities Act, trying to, and I, and I loved the work because it was, it was Cory Booker and Tim Scott and Ron Kine and Pat T. Berry showing that you could have bipartisan, bicameral leadership that would be data-driven and, you, and we're going to try to figure out how to humanize that data to, to bring more private sector capital to, to, to help lift up communities. We haven't been able to execute perfectly, but, but the idea and the thought leadership that goes behind uh, continuing to push our communities forward is, is, is exactly what we need um, uh, more of. Uh, but to hear Mayor Cognetti talk uh, about, about just the data. And I think it's so important that, uh, as the uh, school commissioner from Memphis uh, asked earlier, um, Commissioner Harris asked earlier, how do we humanize our discussions in a way that move people towards action? Uh, I, I'm not talking about you know, how do you bring something down to a sixth grade level or what have you, but how do you actually catch people here and, and, and then get them there and, and get people, those, those of us who are pragmatic progressives who just want to get things done and want to solve problems moving in the right direction. And it's not easy. It's, it's, it's uh, even more difficult in the echo chambers in which we live uh, today. I've used, um, and I was asked to speak briefly about, um, about infrastructure. Infrastructure has been kind of my thing. Uh, my, my colleagues will, will, will tell you that when I served as president of the Conference of Mayors, uh, my, my, my themes were infrastructure, innovation, and inclusion. Infrastructure, innovation, and inclusion, recognizing. And, and, and I, I can't tell you anything about, about infrastructure that, that Mitchell Landry didn't tell you yesterday uh, and, and the rest of the team at, at the White House. We are still uh, at a point, even with a, with a trillion dollars uh, dedicated from the federal government, still at the point that, that the America's infrastructure needs will still wo be woefully underfunded uh, prospectively. We always thought that there was probably more of a, a $4 trillion need. And this, this is hard infrastructure, not even talking about human infrastructure. Uh, uh, and for years, that have been primarily funded by tax exempt municipal bonds. And that, so we, we spent years protecting the tax exemption so that, that cities and states where 80% of our um, infrastructure funding was coming from would be protected in, in using that tool that had been written to the first tax code in 1913. Uh, we had some success there. Now, under the Biden-Harris administration, we have some real help coming from the federal government, not in the form of loans. Uh, almost every dollar from the federal government that came in the, uh, uh, to the state and local governments came in the WIFIA, TIFIA, and usually in, in the form of loans, not, not grants. So we have a, a, an opportunity uh, here now, uh, if we're very thoughtful and we're very strategic, to try and turn that one trillion in, in, into, into several trillion dollars. Uh, how, how do you... Uh, deploy this uh, in, in, in real ways that leverage not only investing in our hard infrastructure, but, but also, although I am a strong supporter of Build Back Better, we don't have to wait for Build Back Better to invest in human infrastructure. If we're thoughtful, if we're strategic, if we're, if we're very careful about doing work with people who share the values of our city. So, so we, we, we decided uh, when I became mayor, and somewhere along the, the second year or so, I'm not sure, so Lauren, Lauren used to run my office, guys, and, and uh, she, it's, it's been all downhill since uh, she left the, the, the shop. But, but about my third year in office, uh, we went from uh, a city that had the largest water sewer system in the, in, the, in the state, by far, to being the largest water sewer system in the, in the state that also happened to own a city, because we were investing so much and our water and sewer infrastructure uh, had some significant challenges coming into the, into the uh, um, uh, into office, but we've we've invested to the tune of about three quarters of a, of, a, of a billion dollars in our water, sewer, and stormwater infrastructure. Been very aggressive about establishing uh, goals regarding in, uh, the, the inclusion of, of 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 local businesses and minority-owned businesses and women-owned businesses. Uh, to the point that every chance we had that we weren't, um, you didn't have to just bid something out. You, you put an RFP or RFQ that, that clearly articulates the priorities, the values of your city, and we, we found some success. And I would encourage you that as you deploy these assets going forward, to be very thoughtful, to be very careful about how you articulate, again, the values of your city. Every single deal we've done, every single bond deal we've done uh, to the tune of three quarters of a billion dollars. 
uh, including the first standalone stormwater green bond in the, in the country, uh, certified green by the Climate Bond Initiative. Every deal has had African-American uh, bond council or underwriters council on, on every deal, has had an, uh, a minority-owned investment bank on every, every single deal. Uh, we've, been, we've been very intentional, and we've gotten incredible uh, service uh, from each of these firms on every single deal. We were very intentional, as we even some people would, would never support building a stadium. We have Baseball Digest's uh, a Stadium of the Decade in, in Segura Park as we work to redevelop a 181-acre uh, campus in, in, in downtown uh, Columbia. We were intentional about local businesses and minority-owned businesses being a part of the team. Uh, we got about 42% um, uh, participation in the, con in the contracting, but we also were, very, we were, we were aggressive in, in going to our housing authority and going to our, our homeless shelters and recruiting people and training people for jobs and, and what we knew would be a, a very robust construction and, and environment. We, we recruited 42, uh, 43 ind individuals, one woman, uh, all, all men. Uh, trained them for several weeks as part of a condition of the contract to, to, to win this business and put them to work. And after uh, that stadium was built, they were building student housing complexes and other uh, projects, giving people an opportunity again to participate in, in this American economic experiment. And I, I transitioned there because uh, I, I think it's so important that all of us, I know this, this is a, a thoughtful crowd and, I, and I, I'm, I'm excited about the leadership I see all across this room. Uh, the, the future of work has changed dramatically. I haven't had a chance to look at the, at the, at the agenda to see how much um, we, we spent time um, uh, talking about future of work. Uh, but places that so many of us thought that we would be in 10 years or, or 15 years, uh, because of the pandemic, we got there a whole lot faster. And, and, the, and the way that, that, that automation and AI and advanced machine learning is fundamentally changing our, our, our workforce, and particularly the way it's, it's hitting people who live in the two bottom quintiles of American economic society, and their lives are fundamentally disrupted uh, right now. How do we very aggressively and, and intentionally rebuild our economies in ways that pull them in? We will have, prayerfully, uh, some of the human infrastructure funding uh, uh, from uh, Bill Back Better and others but with the dollars that we have now, as we, as we deploy uh, ARP dollars, as we deploy infrastructure um, uh, uh, bill dollars, how do we build into the ethos of the communities in which we represent that this is, has to be growth uh, for, for, for every single family that lives in our communities? It requires a, just, a, a, again, the commitment that I know exists in this room, but it requires really intentional action. And I want to encourage you all to continue leading in that space, and I'll be quiet right now. So thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Mayor Benjamin, you touched on something that I wanted to ask both of you. Uh, you both have a background before elected office in some technocratic roles. In economic development, in my, when I was uh, first moved out here, I worked at HUD in public housing. So it's one of the few policy areas where you can actually solve a lot of the problems by literally throwing money at them. But you run into a lot of other hurdle, obstacles and hurdles, and nimbyism. Things that everybody in the room has has experienced. How do you translate those solutions into that sort of coalition that you need to to act on the ground? It's very interesting you bring that up because I yesterday I was hoping to be at the White House, but was still at City Hall. Um, was looking at our zoning map actually and working with the team to think how how are we going to over the years how are we going to change this zoning map to enable the housing future that we need in Scranton, how are we gonna bring people together to understand it, right? We don't wanna, sh we don't wanna force things on people. We don't, don't wanna um, say we know best, that never goes well. Uh, how do we bring the community along and, and maybe run the pilot programs that show that having um, more you know, multi-unit housing zones is, is not a bad thing, it's not. And I think for us in Scranton, what's great is that we are 80,000 people. We are a tight-knit community. We are not a big city. Uh, we're big enough that, that we, you know, we're on the map and, and we can be uh, in rooms like this with these amazing ideas. But we're also small enough that I think we can, we can do the pilot projects. We can make those cases. We can have the conversation um, with, with so many of our residents, with our businesses, with our community over the, the coming years. And so we are gonna try to really bring everyone in. I'm originally from Portland, Oregon, and, and grew up seeing the kind of the housing issues, the, the nimbyism that you see um, all throughout, um, throughout, you know, it's, it's human nature, I suppose, but through the West Coast. So seeing the, the, the crisis that's come about in my hometown and then being in, in Scranton where the housing crisis is very different and we're not quite there, we don't, we're not out of housing. 
Um, but we've got a finite amount of time to build coalitions, talk to people, have them bring th ideas and, and concerns you know, to the table with us. Um, because the, this, the idea that, you know, I told you so, or I know best, DC knows best, um, the folks in Scranton do not take kindly to being told what to think. And so I, we've got a lot of work to do, and I'm excited to hear ideas um, of how you all have done it in your communities. I think um, Mayor Cognetti's uh, focus on, on zoning and some of the artificial um, uh, barriers that we put in place uh, to capital hitting the ground and meeting a, a very specific need is, a, is an important piece of the, of the puzzle. I mean, certainly you need uh, thoughtful zoning and development uh, laws uh, but, um, but in many respects, we have 21st century solutions and, and 20th century and maybe 19th century uh, rules in place that, that govern um, how we deploy these resources. Um, obviously, every community is uh, different, uh, but it, it starts with a, a real uh, dialogue. And, and how, in the world in which we live now, do you source the very best ideas, you get as much input and buy-in to build consensus and then move forward? In our community, um, uh, most of my public discussion is around mixed use, mixed income um, uh, development. You know, everyone has in their ideas, in their heads, uh, in, an idea about about low income housing or, or, or public housing. I do think we should change the low income housing tax credit name to something else uh, because it, it it seems to fuel all types of citizen um, um, uh, outrage at, at, at times. Uh, but the reality is that. Now we have so many more resources to deploy, and we have artificial um, um, uh, barriers up to deploy them. I think some of those are, are, are local, uh, and we have to address it. But I think the, 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 the narrative, again, humanized and focused on, on some of the real challenging areas, the reality is that if you're talking about affordable housing or workforce housing or housing that meets the needs of people who live at 80% or 80 to 120% of, of, of AMI, you're talking about the people who really actually sustain our communities every single day. You're talking about, 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 about teachers and, and public service workers. You're talking about police officers and, and the like. So I think trying to find ways to reframe the discussion uh, that, that bring everyone uh, to, the, to the table is, is, a, is a piece of the puzzle. But I think having more tools, having more creative tools, having um, more tools that give you more flexibility. Um, uh, uh, prior to just the last couple of years, uh, we, were, we were so structured and limited in either a, a, a very low cap on the amount of 9% of, of, of uh, projects we could do with the low-income housing tax credit, uh, some flexibility in the 4% program uh, that allowed us to uh, uh, be aggressive in meeting the workforce housing needs. And we, and we were very lucky in our, in our city. I, I've been mayor for 11 and a half years. Uh, the program's uh, been around longer than that, but I've been mayor long enough to take credit, full credit for it. Uh, the, um, but a wonderful affordable housing program uh, that, that we've uh, uh, developed quite well, S spent a couple years sequestering CDBG funds. Uh, we, 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 we held our CDBG dollars for a few years and stood up a, a home ownership program uh, that uh, we went to um, a, a handful of banks, six banks. One has actually been around since the very beginning of the, of the program. And we, and we, we told them, okay, um, we're going to bring you some, some buyers uh, that might not fit your, your, your profile, um, but we're going to loan them 20% of, of the amount of the, of, of the loan that serves as their down payment. We want you to provide the other 80%. Uh, and uh, someone in our city could walk into a home today uh, with a, a, a modest uh, credit score, $500 out of pocket, uh, maybe 1000 out of pocket, and they'll walk in because our, our, our rate on our money, is, it's loaned out, is, is, is usually about 1%. A blended rate with the, with the, with the bank uh, loan uh, drops that lower than probably any of our mortgages in, in, in this room. And we've got a portfolio now of about $135 million uh, loaned out, a, a default rate that's, that's incredibly low. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's, it's fueled uh, home ownership uh, in our city. We modified that program uh, not long after uh, Michael Brown was killed in, in, in Ferguson um, and to use it as a tool to encourage more of our cities, our cops, uh, to move into the city. Uh, and uh, we, we gave our cops a residency bonus because, again, if you're going to protect the city and, and know and love a city, it, it's great if you live in the city. Uh, and it helps uh, in some of our more challenged neighborhoods to have a police car in, in, in the driveway. So we've been able to use it as a tool, again, to build community and also uh, build long-term wealth uh, the same way most families 
have in this country through home ownership. Oh, that's, great. <clears throat> that's great. Both interesting stories and timely, apparently. Uh, I remember reading that part of the backlog at the, Long, the Port of Long Beach was because of a, uh, a local ordinance that the shipping containers could only be stacked too high. So they waived that and made it four, and instantly you could offload a bunch of boats. This is just to illustrate the power of some of those local <laughs> uh, ordinances that that's you probably, talked about. That's probably the leadership of Mayor uh, Robert Garcia that got that done, just so you know. <laughs> I'm also the president of the Mayor's Mutual Admiration Society, just so you know. Okay. Uh, it, it's, a, it's an unofficial job. So in the pandemic, we saw a record number of new business starts, contrary to sort of uh, the, the last financial crisis. And so I'm wondering, how do you stay nimble to make sure that you nurture those new businesses uh, as they, they move into a, what's going to be a new world for all businesses? We are trying to use um, we're trying to use ARP money to help entrepreneurship. That was an, any of the mayors in this room would remember those early calls with the Treasury Department, and that was the question from I think nearly everyone: um, Can we use this to help our entrepreneurs? Does it have to be an existing business? Because with the CARES Act funding and things, you needed to have been an established business prior to the pandemic. Having the ARP dollars be able to be used to help our entrepreneurs is, is going to be absolutely huge. We're putting some of the dollars to work to put together some WeWork type of spaces in Scranton. We don't really have that yet. Um, so we're going to try to you know, foster that environment for those things, uh, encourage that. We keep um, going out as much as we can and, and having conversations, encouraging people to move to a place like Scranton where the cost of living is far lower than it would be if you're you know, a startup trying to uh, hang in Manhattan while you have no money. So we're, we're continuing on a, a variety of fronts, but the, the ARP money, unlocking that for entrepreneurs is really big, and we'll continue to try to, to do that and also partner with our community colleges and our universities. We have um, five universities and colleges right in our small footprint of Scranton, and our um, community college, Lackawanna Community College, actually was one of Fast Company's uh, most innovative companies last year. Um, they've got some incredible programming for entrepreneurs, and we're continuing to work with them. So um, as one of um, our colleagues said earlier, working with our our partners. We just, if we don't work with our partners, we're never going to get anywhere. Sure. I'd say the, um, so many of us have wonderful programs that have worked in our communities for years. Uh, that are incubator programs, accelerator programs. We have a great program called Fast Track in Columbia. Uh, this is a wonderful time in which to scale up uh, the, those uh, um, projects and, and, and programs and also to replicate uh, ones that you see working in, in, in other communities. The way in which we work has changed fundamentally. I have so many uh, CEOs in other places uh, in, our, in our city who are just scratching their heads trying to figure out how, in fact, uh, they, they adjust to this post-pandemic world in which we live, where our entrepreneurialism, yes, is at an all-time um, uh, high, uh, but it, it's causing some real challenges for a lot of our existing businesses that, that are searching um, for uh, talent. I would also encourage um, all, all of us to, to also pay attention to our are over 50 population, even before the pandemic. Um, uh, those people between 50 and 60 uh, were more entrepreneurial than any other cohort uh, in, in, in our society. And if you think about, uh, I, I use the term perennials as opposed to millennials, uh, uh, the, the, gift that, the, the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Helen, thank you, Helen. Um, but the, um, uh, the idea that if you look, if, if there was pre-pandemic, 50 to 60 year olds were a seven trillion dollar market. You know, if you looked at that in terms of, of GDP, uh, third only to the US and, and China. Uh, I mean, a heck of a market there. So as you're building communities for, for Gen Zers and, and millennials and everything else, don't sleep on perennials. Uh, investing there and investing in people who, who build those businesses who also have not only um, a, a balance sheet but also a significant amounts of experience can also be a, a, a wonderful um, horse to hit your wagon to as, as we uh, prepare for um, for what's next. I think we're getting the hook over here. Are we getting the hook over here? It looks like it. It certainly <laughs> looks that way. I'm hook over here. <laughs> oh, oh, that was, a, that was a swipe of the finger. <laughs> no, uh, but, but thank you all. Thank you for, for including us. Yep, thank you both for being here. Uh, and I think to right here. There you go.